All right, as you can see up on the screen, <clears throat> this is a lesson I think I did years ago, either for a Sunday night or a Wednesday night, and thought maybe I could put it into a PowerPoint and, uh, you know, use it again. Uh, this uh, concept of a GPS, and uh, we know that in our common world, modern world, I should say, this is the global positioning system, but you can see the play here that I've put into this. And, <clears throat> you know, these, uh, this is a, an amazing tool, right? We can, uh, at our fingertips, we can pull up on Google Maps, Google Earth, and, and we can look at the world. And we can see it kind of from a God's viewpoint in the sense that, you know, we can kind of see down and see what, what it looks like maybe from his perspective. But uh, the, the concept here of being in a godly positioning system is really how we relate and connect to God, and especially as we work through our lives. Um, this is a journey, and uh, <clears throat> so hopefully uh, some of this will resonate with you. So the title here, GPS, God's Positioning System, Navigating Our Lives with God's Obedience, or Guidance, excuse me. And I put on here our little pinpoint on this uh, particular map since it's positioned around uh, North America. Uh, there we are, the little red dot. And uh, again, maybe a little perspective on how small we are in comparison to what uh, God is and what he sees. <clears throat> so our presentation overview today is we're going to talk about God's positioning system as it relates to the path of righteousness. We will explore examples in Scripture how believers in God made their way by obedience. We're going to also study under God's positioning system alerts, warnings, and recalibrations. We will delve into the ways that God provides guidance by His Spirit, prayer, and foreknowledge. And finally, in God's positioning system, we're going to talk about things leading to salvation. We will examine how God positions His followers for success in His truth much like a GPS guides us to our destination. And of course, we do count on those GPSs, those modern things, right? Because, you know, these uh, self-driving cars and all these things that are coming up, they tell you what to turn and when to turn, and we put a lot of trust in that. Maybe, maybe we shouldn't, because they are built by men. But again, we're taking the analogy here and putting this under God's positioning system. My first slide here is positioning for success, and it's just a little statement here before we begin. Before we take a trip to any destination, we typically make many preparations. If we were to climb Mount Everest and expect to make it to the top, having a Sherpa to help us along the way would make perfect sense. At the start of our life, we are provided parents as our guides. How they prepared for the journey of parenting can have a direct impact on how well positioned we will be in our life. Parents quickly learn that without God's guidance, raising children becomes immensely more difficult. And yes, that's a statement, and I hope that it's agreeable um, for us here. We really do find ourselves, I think, and I can speak for myself, when you are raising children, it can be quite perplexing at times and a bit overwhelming and uncertain. But if we can lean into God and what He's doing and understand how He's positioning things, it's an immense help. And so that's kind of the under-framing of this sermon today. So we're going to speak a little bit about Abraham and Sarah, God's family plan. And some of these texts, I think, will be quite familiar to most of you, but we want to read them again. I think... Uh, as we all know that things slip out of our minds. And uh, so we'll refresh this. And again, this is a little bit of the framework that I want to begin with here, starting in chapter 12 of Genesis. We'll read the first four verses here. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And we read this because we know uh, with our 
uh, history of, of the scriptures that up to this point, Abraham and Sarah hadn't had any children yet, um, but here God is setting up and staging for him where he's going to be positioned in his life. And he states here, I will make you a great nation. And that cannot happen without him having children. Now we're going to pop down to chapter 13 and read verses 14 and 16, or uh, excuse me, 14 through 16. <clears throat> Verse 14, And the Lord said to him, Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see I give to you and your descendants forever. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. God's establishing a location, a place where he would be establishing this great nation, and it was foretold to, to Abram that this is where it was going to be. Now we'll jump down to chapter 15, <clears throat> verses 1 through 6. And after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram, I am your shield. Your exceeding, exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven, and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. What is God doing here with Abram? He's setting him up. He's giving him this knowledge of what will come. Now, of course, Abram had to take this to heart and believe in it so he could take action. He could have very easily said, well, I can't believe this. I'm 75 years old. I, how can I have children? And of course, we know that that's kind of how things were moving along. But yet, it didn't stop him from moving forward. Abram kept believing it and kept keeping himself positioned and aligned with God. Now we're going to jump all the way down to chapter 22. Things have progressed along here. In verse 11, And the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here am I. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And this uh, thought uh, popped in my head at the adult class today. You know, we, we talk about how good and righteous and pure Christ was, and yet God was willing to sacrifice him. And here we can see a bit of a correlation, right? Abraham progressing through in his journey with God, he was still aligned with him and thinking, okay, well, he's, tell, he's telling me I have to sacrifice my son. And he went through the process all the way to this moment where the angel interrupted him and said, no. But we can see the result of this. Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God. And this is something that is uh, important for us in our journey. What do we fear? Do we fear things in this life? They're temporary. But we need to put our fear and our trust and our awe, our uh, understanding of what God can do in His power. And Abraham, here Abram still, was able to say, or excuse me, it was Abraham at this point. He was able to say, I can trust God that, he told me, I'm going to have descendants from my own body. And therefore, he understood that God was going to make this right. It takes a lot of faith, and that's what's important in this journey. 
Jump down to chapter 24. We'll quickly read 1 through 4. Now Abraham was old, well advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. So Abraham said to the older servant of his house, who ruled over all that he had, Please put your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell, but you shall go to my country and to my family and take a wife for my son Isaac. <clears throat> So here Abram, Abraham was you know, coming to the end and he was looking out for his, his family, thinking ahead about what God had already told him and he was lining up and saying, well, here's what God set up. This is the position I'm in. Therefore, to get my son to move forward in this same process, I expect and think that this would be the right thing to do. And he took, took the opportunity to move his son towards having one of the uh, daughters of his family instead of the Canaanites. And then we'll pop back to Genesis 18. I'm going to read a couple here just to kind of tie in this whole family and God's positioning and how things work with the parents, how important these things become. Verse 16 of chapter 18. Then the men rose from there and looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to send them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham and what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his house, household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord, to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham and what he has spoken to him. And so we can see in the midst of this a history of where God's destroying Sodom and Gomorrah, this nice little tidbit of information explaining that God knows that Abraham will bring this truth, this uh, plan of God to bring his people, his nation, forward. So again, this is kind of a little foundation for the things that we're going to move forward with. So with the GPS, the godly positioning system, we're looking for guidance, right, along the way. God's Word provides us with guidance and wisdom for navigating the complexities of life. It teaches us about God's character, right? You think about the things that God did with Abraham already in Genesis. What did that teach us about his character? His plan for salvation. We see resurrection, right? Abraham believed in resurrection right out of the gate. He had to come to that conclusion. Otherwise, he would not have any children from his own body and how to live in a way that honors him. Deuteronomy 32.4 says, The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. It's very important for us to know that our God is just and upright. And this idea that he's a rock, rocks are solid. They don't move. That's important for us as we walk and trust in what he's doing. Psalms 86.11 says, Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. Good thing to realign ourselves with. And then Proverbs 3, 1 through 2, My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands. For the length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. Yeah, God set up rules. He's got laws. And here we're reminded here in the Proverbs that if we follow them, Length of days and long life and peace will be added to us. Those are important. And then Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. And yeah, we know how life, as we get older and we're bringing ourselves through things, there's trials, there's challenges. Sometimes we come across these choices, right? These whys in the road. Which way are we going to go? And the ad admonition here for the parents is to bring up your child in the way he should go. And hopefully he'll make the right choice. So now we're going to speak to prayer as a navigation tool. Prayer is a way to connect with God. We'll read that here in the story of Hannah in 1 Samuel 1, just a little snippet, 10 and 11. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. Hannah had no children. And so she was very distraught. Um, the other uh, concubine wife, they were having children and she was left out. 
And she says in her prayer, and she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give to him the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. And we can look at this story and its completion and see that God heard this prayer. It's a way to connect, right? We, we need to have prayer in our lives. Prayer brings guidance and strength. Mark 14, 35 and 36. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, and we're speaking of Christ, the one we spoke of before, God's only son. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And there are other accounts of this as Jesus was praying that it was very stressful. It said that there were drops of blood from his brow. And then I want to read in uh, 2 Kings chapter 20. So give me a second and we'll turn over to that. About comfort and peace. And there's, there's so many different texts, of course, that you can bring to bear. So you, I pull these from what I can remember and think of. So you think of many, I'm sure. In chapter 20, verse 1, this is talking about Hezekiah. In those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death. And Isaiah the, the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. It's a very sobering statement. Then he turned his face towards the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, Remember now, O Lord, I pray, now I have, how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart and have done what was good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And it happened before Isaiah had gone out into the middle court that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Return and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, thus says the Lord, the God of David your father, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Surely I will hear, heal you. On the third day you shall go up to the house of the Lord, and I will add to your days 15 years. I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for my, for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. And it goes on and talks about how uh, Isaiah gave him instruction to be healed. Now we can look at those 15 years and say that's a win. But 15 years and then you're going to die, that's a loss. Okay, so we can look at this. Yes, the, the important part of this is that God heard his prayer and he did something. And I think we can trust that God does hear our prayers. But sometimes the answer might seem really great. But until we have resurrection, until we attain e eternal life, all things are temporary. And that was the case here. Hezekiah, of course, went on with his life, and at the end, he still made more mistakes and had challenges. So there is a lot of that that comes in our lives, even if we want to extend it. But our hope and our goal is to position ourselves for salvation. So showing and speaking truth to others. And yes, that's Tim, way back in the back of that picture there. Matthew 5.37 says, Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. A lot of times we complicate the speech and things that we say, but if we can just remember the truth and stick with those absolutes, we'll always be in a better spot if we can be. It's always hard because life isn't black and white, is it? But we do get this excellent advice. Keep things basic, truthful. Make your yay, yay, and your nay, nay. Matthew 7, 12. So whatever you wish that others would do you to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. And I mentioned about the law earlier. Law is all important because we, if we conflict with God, if we break his laws, we will lose his grace and his forgiveness. So we can see here one of the things that will help us in positioning ourselves with God is that if we will put in our minds that if we can think about this, this golden rule, you wish that others would do to you, you do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. It really will help position yourself, yourself better with God. Putting others first. And then in Ephesians 4, 25-27, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let 
each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Again, some of the things that were brought up this morning in the adult class. We are in this world. We're all in it together. And yes, we have an adversary. And we don't want to give him opportunity. So grabbing our GPS, our godly positioning system, let's recognize where Satan's at and not give him opportunity. That's what this thing can do for you. And the advice here is some of the biggest reasons we get into problems is because of anger, our own pride, and the things that get us in a position where we start to sin. And of course, in this same verse, it gives us the remedy. Get it taken care of. Things are going to happen. You will get angry, but correct it. Get it fixed. Speaking about serving others, in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 7, it says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. This component of love, which I've said and I firmly believe in myself, this is the act of service. Putting, putting aside our own selfish ambitions, and again, it was brought up in the adult class what idolatry truly is. It's that self-serving, I'm going to take care of me and have a good time for me, and that's going to be my life. That's not what we are, are admonished to do. Here we see a position of love, of service, helping others. This positions ourselves right with God. Ephesians 5, 15 through 17, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Yeah, the days are evil. We, we can look around. We can see what's happening. It's not going the way God has intended. And again, we contrast that. We look at our position in this earth and what's going on around us, and we have to realign and consider that that position that God wants us to be in can't be part of this world. It can't be participating in the things that are going on. Using our gifts. Our gifts are not meant to be used solely for our own benefit, but to serve others. By using our gifts to help others, we, in effect, recalibrate our positioning with God, reflecting His light to the world and bring glory to His name. I want to read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we'll do 10 through 13. <clears throat> First Corinthians 1 verse 10 says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there are no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? He goes on and he talks about how he wants us to recognize our position with God. All of these people that were participating in God's work were that. They were workers. They were laborers. All of this is about how we work for God, how we reflect His light using our gifts to keep that message of the kingdom, kingdom and hope to others alive. That's what 
we're admonished to do here. And to get wrapped up in names and people is a detraction. Luke 12, 16. Go back to chapter, uh, Luke chapter 12. Sixteen through twenty-one. <clears throat> All right, starting in verse sixteen, it says, "Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully, and he thought him within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this: I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods." And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then, when, then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. This man made an error. He got focused on the things that were happening in this temporary life. He built up these goods, expecting that he could sit back and kind of cruise. And what does God say? You fool. I'm going to require your life now. And this is a big lesson for us. This parable tells us to not think that we're not constantly having to move forward towards this goal of salvation. He got a little off track. And then 2 Timothy 2, 20 and 21. Second Timothy 2.20 says, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor and sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. As we think about positioning ourselves with God, we have to consider what kind of vessel we're going to be. We want to be a vessel to honor. And that says that we have to separate. That's what sanctification is. Again, brought up again this morning in the adult class. These are the things that God is working for. He's separating those that don't want to work and do what he's asking. And then setting aside those that are willing to do that. To receive his promise. So using our gifts. These are things to think about as we are positioning ourselves with God. What do we do with these things that he's given us? And how do we leverage them for His benefit? The Bible as a roadmap. The Bible is like a roadmap that helps us navigate through life so we can reach our goal. We've been laying this foundation of God's plan, obviously using His scriptures. And the idea here is that they will bring us all the way through. But the condition is we have to read them, we have to believe them. It doesn't happen without the effort on our part to pursue this. So guidance in life through prophetic messages, 2 Peter 3. Read that one real quick. 2 Peter 3, 1 through 7. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts. This is an important piece of understanding how this global or godly positioning system helps us. Here is some foreknowledge that's given to us, and we can see these things happening around us. People walking according to their own lusts. They're just doing whatever they think feels good and is right in their own mind. And saying, where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, and all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation... For this they willingly forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So we see here this understanding of the conditions leading up to the time of Christ's return and what we can expect. So we look at our godly positioning system here, and we can see this is the stuff that's happening. 
There's wisdom, of course, that comes from God's Word. Let's read Matthew 19, verse 29. Matthew 19, 29. too far. Here we go. It's one of the difficulties of using an electronic Bible. You kind of forget how many pages you have to flip through. Matthew 19, verse 29. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundred, hundredfold and inherit eternal life. Now how does this fit into what we established at the beginning? God's plan is centered around family. It's centered around these descendants. All of the children that were supposed to come up. And Abraham, he was known to teach his children. Of course, we read these things and we have to apply them to our families and our time. And yet, we can't control our children, can we? We can't make them believe. We can't force them to do what's right. We can only show them and guide them. And here we can see that at some point, we can see a separation here because those choices have a consequence. Everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. We aren't going to read the other side of that, which isn't very good. Eternal death. And applying God's teaching, Galatians 5, verses 22 through 25. Galatians 5, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such there is no law, and those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. And the key word here is if. There has to be a choice made. If we are to follow God's will and provide a position of ourselves for Him, for truth, we're going to have to take on these fruits of the Spirit. These are things that we have to work at. Love, we have to practice that. Joy, peace, these are all things, patience, that we have to go and pursue. So alerts, warnings, and recalibrations. James 4. <clears throat> James 4, 7 through 10. Therefore, verse 7, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. These are the things that we're admonished to do to reposition, to recalibrate ourselves with God. 2 Corinthians 13. So we'll go back a little bit here. 5. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. We are tasked to examine ourselves. That's part of this recalibration, this understanding that if I want to be in line with God, I've got to take a look at myself. That's not always fun or easy, is it? Because sometimes we find out there's things about us that we've got to change that aren't right with God. Then back in James, chapter 5, and verses 7 through 11. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, 
waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and later rain? You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end of intended, end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. And again, we're leveraging this understanding of where God's at in His plan, looking the, at the examples, the things that the prophets said and told to help us position ourselves in alignment with God. Trusting God's plan. Trusting in God's plan requires us to let go of our own plans and trust in His guidance, even when the path ahead seems uncertain. When we trust in God, we can have peace and confidence in knowing that He's in control. Reading in Psalms 31.3, For you are my rock and my fortress, fortress, and for your name's sake you lead me and guide me. In 2 Corinthians 13.11, Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. All of these things are the things that we change, that we have to take time to calibrate and to align ourselves with God in His position. And my mother's favorite verse, or at least a portion of it, Joshua 24, 15, But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And of course, when we think about God's plan and the family of God and what He's intending to do, we have to take this on, make the choice to serve the Lord. My conclusion, by trusting in God's plan and following His guidance, we can live lives of purpose, impact others, and reach for eternal life. Let us embrace God's positioning system and journey towards our destination with hope and faith. And Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14 says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall break every work, bring excuse me, every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. We have to make these changes. We have to look at where we're at in position with God, consider the truth of what he's saying, and make those changes so that we can be found worthy of his eternal reward. Thank you.
God again for this time that we can be together to meet in peace and safety, to open up your words of truth and to make an attempt to apply them to our lives. We hope that uh, as we consider these things that we would make the changes to position ourselves better with you so that we can succeed and help ourselves and others to come to eternal life. We ask for forgiveness when we fall short of your will and expectations and to always be with those who are searching for the truth and uh, would guide and direct them as you see fit. Give us strength to continue on in these days to always be ready to give an answer to any that might ask. We look forward to the day when your son does return. In Jesus' name.